international specialist of the Global Leaders Programme. Facing the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the Global Leaders Programme has initiated a series of events designed to support the continued growth of sidelined professionals in the music industry. This is our seventh open enrollment webinar today. So far, these webinars have caught the attention of people connecting from more than 25 countries around the world. We feel honored to have you all here and we do hope this initiative will help you uh, get through these challenging times. Kind request, if you haven't already, please make sure to um, switch to the desktop version of GoToTraining by clicking on the purple flower at the top right corner of your screen. Write your name and country of residence in the chat box and share your feedback with us by uh, filling out the survey in the end of a webinar. Few words about the Global Leaders Programme. Our programme offers an Ivy League curated nine-month executive graduate certificate in social entrepreneurship, cultural agency, policy leadership, teaching artistry and organisational management, led in partnership with nine top universities, including Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, NYU and McGill. Our faculty includes Nobel laureates, Grammy winners and TED presenters. We have a network of institutional fieldwork hosts spanning more than 40 countries around the world. GOP cohort members are musical leaders and change makers, connected by proven accomplishments, growth potential and commitments to excel. Our today's guest speakers are Marcelo Jordan from the World Bank Group and Tricia Tunstall. She's an author and educator. Marcelo specializes in responsible investment and currently works for the World Bank Treasury as Senior Portfolio Manager for Environmental, Social and Governance Integration. He has also worked for the uh, UN Climate Convention. Tricia is a writer, speaker, consultant and a teacher who focuses on music education and social change. Her latest book is Playing for Their Lives, the Global El Sistema Movement for Social Change Through Music, co-authored with Eric Booth. The moderator of today's session is Katie White from El Sistema USA. Katie is a co-founder of Kids Notes, North Carolina's leading El Sistema inspired organization and director of El Sistema USA. Professor Wyatt teaches music and social entrepreneurship at Duke University and has been keynote speaker for the League of American Orchestras. Dear guests, wonderful to have you here. Katie, please take over. Thank you so much, Gosha. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Katie, the president and CEO of El Sistema USA. We are the National Association of Programs Inspired by El Sistema in the United States and Canada. We have 115 organizational members. I uh, met Trisha in Venezuela for the first time and our uh, shared love of El Sistema and the movement of music for social change that has taken the world by storm. And Trisha introduced us to Marcelo Jordan with the World Bank. We were really interested in exploring the connection between the World Bank's sustainable development goals of the United Nations and the, the ethos and practice of El Sistema and music for social change around the world. Trisha, we, uh, we're gonna kick it off with you. If you'll bring up your webcam, great. Before Trisha begins, just one more logistical point. We would love to take your questions throughout the webinar, so please add them to the chat box. And I will do two things. I'll both pepper Trisha with questions and we'll collect appropriate questions for the end for further discussion too. Thank you so much. We're glad to have you. Trisha, take it away. Thank you, Katie. I'm delighted to be here and to do this in conjunction with you and, and Marcelo and really lovely to meet um, all of you in the audience virtually. Thank you so much, so much for being here. And I'm excited to talk to you today about this idea of our work in context of the sustainable development goals and i want to start by saying that this idea this inquiry that we're going to do today is fairly new to people in both fields it's not usual to look at how arts education can be a catalyst for sustainable development goals 
and it's also not usual for people involved in sustainable development work across the world to look to arts education. So we're trying to bridge that and find that intersection. And we're just at the beginning stages of this inquiry. It's, at the, it's a new frontier. Uh, let me start by asking Katie to help me take a poll here. I'd love to know how many of you um, would uh, to know something about the SDGs or not at all. Katie, can you set up that poll for us? Yes, actually, Pedro is going to do it. So here is the quick poll. Which of the sentences below best describes your familiarity with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Agenda of 2030? Um, Katie, I see that about 50% of the cohort of the attendees has already voted. Let's give them a few more seconds, and then I will show the results with you. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two and the poll is closed here are the results great trisha back to you am i still i can't i can't see my my, my screen here my, am i still on you, uh, if you want me to get rid of the yeah. results yeah. okay great yeah that would be good. Then we'll be able to see you again yeah that would be good Okay, much better. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that's exciting uh, that this is an opportunity for so many people who don't know about these uh, SDGs to find out about them. Um, we're really we kind of consider you to be our frontline in the field, on the ground partners and colleagues in this inquiry, and so we're eager to learn from you as well. Um, we hope that by our I. Our ideal goal for this session is that by looking at the potential of the work that you do through this new lens of the UN's SDGs, you may find new opportunities for projects that are working at the intersections of the arts and social development. And even new partnerships, we could involve new financial partnerships, new opportunities for projects, people that you could collaborate with and think, uh, think with and act with that you haven't thought of before in that way. Um, so what I'd like to do before, Marcelo is going to very shortly describe to you the SDGs, their, their genesis, their development, and what they mean in the world. Before he does that, before you even know that context, let's just look at them at face value. And I'd like each of you to take 60 seconds to study these sustainable development goals on this slide. Uh, <clears throat> just take a look at them and choose two that you think a music for social change program, such as yours or such as the ones you know of, could actually really clearly contribute to achieving. I'll say that one more time. Choose two of these goals, read them through, and choose two that you think your work, the work of music for social change programs, actually could contribute to in concrete ways in the world. So we're gonna give you sort of 60 seconds to think about that and do that and write your one or two goals in the chat box. Pedro, can you keep track of 60 seconds? Yes, Great. I am keeping track. Good.
uh, the minute is over. Okay, uh, we are going to return to these later and Whoa. talk about them at some length. And now I think it's, I'd like to turn this uh, over to Marcelo, who's going to illuminate, uh, elucidate and illuminate these goals for you. Marcelo, take it away. Thank you, Tricia. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here sharing with you some insights into the global development agenda. You've heard about the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals are probably one of the main elements of what is called as the global development agenda. And now I'm going to try to elaborate a little bit on what it all means and what is the relevance when it comes to discussing how music and the arts can contribute to these to achieving these goals. So Pedro, if we can move over to the next slide, um, probably the next two slides, so we can get right into the content. So the, um, the a little bit of chronology to start with, uh, to, to try to understand where we stand right now and what the sort of challenges we're facing. After the Second World War, um, the next decades were basically devoted to reconstructing Europe, reconstructing basically the world, and the world started to uh, massively industrialize in itself, especially in the more developed economies. And developing countries also started to uh, get into the um, train of development and industrialization. So the, the, those three decades between 1940s, 50s, 60s, were basically devoted to um, a significant amount of industrialization and mass production. So that started, of course, to raise questions about the natural environment and the impact of the natural environment. So uh, there was a lot of uh, wealth and economic growth that was being achieved, but that was also being achieved at the expense of a significant amount of natural resources and also uh, the degradation of different uh, natural environments. That prompted um, a number of um, social Marcelo? movements. Yes. Can I interrupt you for a second? Could you please turn on your webcam? Oh, sorry. Apologies for that. I hope you can see me now. OK, so here I am. So I was saying um, there was an, a number of social uh, movements, a number of um, awareness raising that happened in the 60s, um, different authors, different thinkers and philosophers, as well as, of course, environmental activists, started raising the alarm in terms of the loss of natural um, life and especially biodiversity that was happening. And um, the government started to listen to that. And there was the first um, ever government summit that was devoted to environmental topics that happened in 1972 in Stockholm. So uh, that was the um, United Nations, it was a United Nations hosted uh, summit. And um, it was called uh, the Summit for the Natural Environment. It was the first time that government started discussing the um, impact of economic development on the environment. Um, at that time, um, there was the decision to create an agenda uh, for this topic, and therefore um, the UN decided to establish what is called um, the United Nations Environment uh, Environmental Program, or UNEP. It's something that uh, we still have today uh, in place, and it's an organization, a very big organization within the UN system. And uh, the mission is precisely to promote uh, environmental awareness and environmental sustainability. Um, in the 70s, um, there were a lot of economic um, issues happening. We had a lot of inflation at that time. There was the oil crisis in the Middle East. And then we got into the 80s. The 80s had a number of um, different um, situa economic situations around the, the globe. We had a lot of um, economic crisis in Latin America. But at the same time, Asia was taking off as an economic um, powerhouse. And um, that was sort of exacerbating two issues. On one hand, the economic crises that were happening in different parts of the world were exacerbating um, social inequalities. Uh, but the, the takeoff of Asian economies started to show how much um, damage that can cause to the environment and to natural resources. So <clears throat> in view of those issues, um, 
and in view of the fact that the first uh, ever uh, UN summit in the 1970s uh, didn't have a specific mechanisms for action, governments decided to get together again and they organized the Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, at that summit, um, governments decided to adopt a, adopt a more aggressive agenda, more ambitious agenda for uh, preserving the environment. And there were a number of uh, conventions that stem from that, um, from that summit. One of them is the um, Convention on Climate Change, the UNF, UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We had the Convention on Biodiversity and a number of other environmental conventions under the United Nations system, whereby countries decided to um, work together more formally with more specific mechanisms to try to, have, to develop some sort of accountability for achieving these um, objectives of environmental um, sustainability. During those discussions, um, it started to become clear that sustainability cannot be achieved only on the basis of environmental preservation, but also in terms of the social context. Because um, inequality was becoming more and more of an issue, it was becoming more and more acute, um, which was an irony because there was a lot of economic development, but at the same time, uh, poverty was also rising and the difference between rich and poor people, uh, the gap, the poverty gap was still growing and getting wider. <clears throat> that led to um, another set of um, discussions um, that happened in the two early 2000s, especially the Millennium Summit, uh, where a number of goals were achieved, where for the first time both social as well as environmental goals were put together in one single set of aspirations. And we had at that time what were called the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were supposed to be goals that um, are me uh, were meant to be achieved by 2015. You have here in the slide, there were five goals and you can see um, they are a mix of environmental and social issues. For example, we have eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, promote gender equality and empower women. Um, so there was a lot of um, emphasis on the social aspects of, of development and we also had some um, references to environmental issues for example number seven ensure environmental sustainability number eight uh, showed that um, all these other goals cannot be achieved in by uh, individual action but rather by collective action so that was the concept behind partnerships for development so that was what what was driving the um, global development agenda at that point in time uh, I have to say that um, it was mostly separated efforts to some extent. Uh, we had, for example, environmental um, conventions under the UN working on different um, topics that were very specific to their own field of expertise and purview. And on the other hand, we had still um, a lot of work on social issues also on sort of like parallel separate tracks. Pedro, if you could move, if you could move over to the next slide, please. So what happened then, um, it was clearly um, becoming more clear that um, development cannot be achieved only by either tackling environmental issues separately or social issues. And even if you wanted to tackle the environmental issues, it was becoming very clear that uh, you had also to solve different social issues before you wanted to, before you were able to actually address different environmental issues and the other way around. Uh, if we wanted to create a more socially sustainable places or, or communities, then you also had to address different environmental challenges. Therefore, um, countries have started discussing this, reviewing the, the Millennium Development Goals, and um, by 2015, which was the, the timeline for the Millennium Development Goals, there were a number of negotiations um, that resulted in what is now uh, known as the Global Development Agenda 2030. So there was another 15 years uh, time frame um, where countries, governments decided to um, establish a number of goals um, for um, to be achieved by 2030. And these goals were very comprehensive and the aim was to integrate 
environmental issues, social issues, governance issues, as well as um, partnership uh, issues. So you have, therefore, the 17 the Sustainable Development Goals. That is the main framework that is driving the global development agenda between now and 2030, especially between 2015 and 2030. But also at the same time uh, that year, there were a number of other um, agreements between governments that um, conform different pillars of this global development agenda. And one of the main elements as well is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, where countries decided that um, they were going to work towards um, a two-degree scenario for with regards to climate change, uh, ideally one, uh, not allowing uh, climate change to go beyond 1.5 degrees in an ideal world, but at least uh, not more than two degrees. This is an aspirational goal agreed upon by countries under the Paris Agreement, and um, they, the, the concept of climate action is precisely to try to achieve that, that goal. At the same time, there was another um, set of negotiations happening on a different uh, negotiation, negotiating track, where that, which resulted in um, declaration in Addis Abeba of the financing for development. Because all these different goals, the SDGs as well as the climate change goal, cannot be achieved unless there are what is called means of implementation. It's, it's meaning um, you need, um, on one hand, you need finance, you need investments, you need technology, you need capacity building, you need a number of resources to be able to achieve those goals. So therefore, this was the um, discussion about the means for implementing this um, development agenda. One of the main conclusions of this um, agreement is that um, public sources continue to, to, to be one of the most important sources of funding and resources for achieving the global development agenda. But at the same time, it was recognized that they are not the only one. In fact, they actually should leverage another, a, a number of different other sources of, um, of funding and resources. Um, for example, uh, multilateral development banks will play a significant part of uh, mobilizing different um, financial actors to try to um, create what is called a cascade effect in terms of um, financing for the sustainable development goals. But also, more importantly, probably for that declaration was the fact that the, for the first time it was recognized that private actors also um, must play an important role in contributing to achieving these uh, development goals. Before that, um, private actors were supposed to be, um, not, were not supposed to have much involvement in development. It was supposed to be left for mostly philanthropic um, initiatives, but not necessarily viewed as a responsibility. Uh, after this um, agreement, it's now understood that the private sector has an important role to play and in fact, um, there is a responsibility for um, different um, financial um, actors to try to incorporate these um, different concepts and goals into their own um, financial um, objectives. So um, one of the reasons why uh, 2030 was chosen is because, um, because of two, mainly, mainly probably because of two reasons. One is because um, there is a cycle of reviews every um, five years or every other um, four, uh, four year cycle and five year cycle that coincided with 2030. So from a practical point of view, 2030 was a reasonable time frame for taking stock of the um, achievement of these or fulfillment of these goals. On the other hand, um, the advice from different um, scientific bodies were pointing to the fact that by 2030, there were a number of thresholds that um, and tipping points that were crucial for ensuring that the, the world will remain a habitable uh, 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 place. <clears throat> and um, if we do not uh, change course, if we do not change the pathway we are currently on, um, the, the, it may become um, virtually impossible to reverse and we may be facing a scenario where we have a runaway climate change or um, environmental degradation to such an extent that it will be impossible to, um, to have um, any, any capacity to, to revert those, those problems. So based also on recommendations by the scientific community, 2030 was considered a reasonable 
uh, uh, time frame for for um, uh, having a, a review of these, a significant review of these um, of these progress. So um, there are a number of different challenges that need to be solved. Um, on the social side, we have especially inequality, we have inclusion and diversity, poverty eradication, human rights. Uh, on the environmental side, we have climate change, biodiversity conservation, forests, oceans, water, natural habitats. And I put an, an asterisk on climate change because climate change is a very um, complex and, and very um, comprehensive issue that will touch not only on environmental issues, but also will touch on social as well as economic issues. Uh, climate change is forcing different communities, for example, to, to adapt, to change their livelihoods, to change their, um, the way they uh, produce their food or the way they, they go about their own their, their daily businesses. <clears throat> and that will gradually be the case for everybody. So everybody will need to, at some point in time, adapt to climate change. And that will require also a number of industrial conversion, um, economic transformation, technological transformation, and therefore climate change will be affecting um, basically all the different activities that we, that, we, that we know. Governance is also a key area uh, where we have justice, we have democracy and civil liberties, freedom of expression, and those elements are, I think, very important to enable action on all the other issues. Without, for example, civil liberties and democracy, and justice, for example, it will be very difficult to um, be able to bring together different actors around these goals. And on the institutional level, we have also the issues of accountability, transparency, and partnerships. And um, this should also be something that needs to be taken into account when thinking about the role that each one of us can play, especially at the institutional level more than individual level. Um, in terms of uh, promoting different uh, sustainable development goals. I want to make a brief comment in terms of sustainability um, because we are talking about sustainable development goals or sustainable um, action uh, aspirations, etc. Sustainability is a, a sort of an elusive concept. It's um, very hard to define. I don't think there is a formal definition of sustainability. However, the most commonly um, understanding of sustainability refers to the capacity of um, different um, generations to be able to enjoy and have the same level of um, access to the resource, natural resources. And um, initially, the idea was that this has to be an intergenerational issue. And the, the concept was, how can we achieve intergenerational generational fairness and justice, meaning what we are enjoying today, our generation, um, should also be left for other generations in the future to, 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 to take um, advantage of as well as to enjoy. <clears throat> now, this, this has also um, expanded to cover not only intergenerational concepts, but also interspecies concepts. And therefore, that's why we now have the idea of um, preserving the environment, not only for future generations, but also because we need to have a number of different, um, um, we need to have the biodiversity wealth that we are in, uh, 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 inheriting, because that's also very fundamental for how the planet itself um, functions and works. So um, that is a little bit of the idea behind sustainability. And, um, I want to uh, now uh, start moving over to th in the direction of um, what is the role of um, artists, uh, music educators, and music in particular. Um, who does what? That's a very important question because um, initially, uh, I'm talking about decades ago, it was mostly thought that governments are responsible for all that. Then it was governments and civil society, but then um, nowadays we are thinking about a number of very wide range of um, different um, uh, stakeholders and actors. As I mentioned before, private sector, entrepreneurs, investors, governments, civil society, activists, uh, international organizations, academia, um, everybody has a role to play. 
And um, it, what is important is to try to understand what is our potential, what is the potential of each one of, uh, of those actors, and how they can come together and achieve synergies to achieve the, the, the social development goals. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the private sector because um, the private sector is probably the main source of finance. Um, we know that um, the majority of um, financial resor resources, capital in particular, is held by different um, private sector investors. And um, I want to refer to the concept that was used basically, especially in the 70s, where we had uh, what is called 20th century capitalism, where the theory was that the, the companies, the corporations, sole purpose should be to maximize value for sharehold, shareholders. Now, um, if we move, or if we come back to the present, uh, if we go to the next slide, the modern understanding of the, resp the, the, the responsibility of a company is not only that it has to maximize value for shareholders, but it has to do so by also taking into account environmental and social uh, considerations. And that is known as the triple bottom line. So, it needs to strive for economic and um, financial profitability, but at the same time, it should also strive for achieving environmental and social sustainability, <clears throat> being responsible towards um, different stakeholders, community, society, owners or shareholders, customers, employees, suppliers, lenders, government, etc. So that is the new modern understanding of the responsibility of the um, private sector, the corporate um, sector. And I think that's important to understand when it comes to trying to think of different initiatives and how to capture uh, the opportunities uh, to um, um, try to capture different resources from, from these actors as well. So um, now I'm going to move over uh, to the final slide that I have for you. Um, I would like to invite you to reflect a little bit in terms of what is our individual responsibility, uh, what is our collective responsibility, how do art and music contribute towards the SDGs? This is precisely, I think, the topic of this discussion. I'm very excited to be part of this discussion. And uh, I think there will be many opportunities because I think music education touches not only in terms, uh, or in terms of the um, empowerment of individuals, but also in terms of um, different sustainable development goals as was expressed during the, the poll. I'm very curious to see what the results were. But in any case, I want to highlight the fact that there are opportunities with philanthropy, with entrepreneurship and responsible investments. That is something new. Uh, we have uh, opportunities with uh, funding for education, funding for activism, um, and also awareness raising. All of that, I believe, is um, something that music education is related to. So I'll be happy to participate in the discussion. I probably have some more ideas, but I would like to um, come back to Trisha and Katie, and we can continue this discussion. Thank you, Marcelo. That was wonderful. Um, Katie, did you want to say a few words? Yes, thanks. So from the comments uh, collected in the chat box around the top sustainable development goals this group uh, thought were most important, they included good health and well-being, quality education, gender, in gender equality, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. In addition to those, we also had some votes for number 17 and number eight, if we could bring up the goals again. Of those goals, the very top voted were uh, good health and well-being, quality education, and reduced inequalities. And you can see 17 is partnerships for the goals, and eight is decent work and economic growth. Marcella, one of the questions that came up in the chat during your presentation, and I think is really relevant now, is do you, are you involved in conversations or is the World Bank about changes to these goals at this point as a result of the pandemic? 
No, I think these goals are set uh, until 2030. And it's also important to mention that um, under these goals, there are a number of targets. So when you look at the targets, there are probably around 70 or 80 of them, each one of them related to one of these specific um, SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. And each target, in fact, has their own set of indicators that were recently uh, adopted to try to help um, you know, all this process to understand how to move towards these goals. When it comes to the COVID crisis, um, I don't think that it has changed anything yet. In any case, it's very early to tell, but from my experience in these um, negotiations and in this process, I doubt it will change anything. It will only probably highlight the need for, uh, or the urgency of some of them as opposed to others, um, but I don't think that uh, that will change necessarily the set of SDGs because I think the SDGs in general are very comprehensive. Thank you. And uh, another question that has come up in the chat box, which I think Tricia will link really directly to yours, is the idea of how achieving these sustainable development goals is related to music and uh, in particular the movement of El Sistema. So just as a reminder, our top goals were good health and well-being, quality education, and reduced inequalities. And would love to hear more about how music and some of the music for social change models around the world are accomplishing these goals, and uh, in particular, El Sistema. Great. I would love to take that on. Um, the I think it, what was exciting about hearing Marcelo's presentation is to is that we're hearing about something that we don't in the arts and arts education we don't usually hear about very much, which is you know economic actors, global agencies, the you know that whole world of of uh, global development that um, we don't think about very much, and we certainly don't think of us ourselves as actors in on the same level as NGOs and government agencies and stuff. But I think that Marcelo is inviting us to begin to think of ourselves as actors in those spheres with those entities. Uh, and it's, we know, we all know that in our work as music educators for social change, we all know that our work profoundly affects individuals. We've seen it, we've felt it. We know that our work profoundly affects communities, families and communities. But this is an invitation to think bigger than that. And so with that in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about El Sistema, which is my particular field. Uh, the thing, the, it's the uh, arts for social change area that I know the best. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it began, how it developed, how I see it in the context of this inquiry. And then we're going to invite discussion from all of you about the connection, that exact question that Katie brought up, the connection between music, music and music education uh, and these goals. But here's, so here's, uh, here's a snapshot of one Music for Social Change uh, program, El Sistema. For those of you who, who don't know, it was born in Venezuela 45 years ago in 1975. It was the brainchild of an economist, musician, government administrator, genius. Uh, Jose Antonio Abreu, who uh, founded it in 1975 and quickly at, began with it as a youth orchestra, but quickly developed it as a music education program, especially for children in um, underserved areas. And he had the forethought to establish it as a youth development agency within the government when the government offered to support his this initiative. He said, yes, but it's not a cultural we don't want it in arts and culture, we want it in youth development because we want it to stay and we don't want it to be cut when budgets are cut, which in arts and culture is always the first to be cut. So since about 1977, that has been the, uh, the mandate of El Sistema in Venezuela. And it gradually grew over the years since then to include by uh, the time I got to it in 2009, over 500,000 kids learning music every single day after school, always in ensemble, mostly in orchestral ensemble, also band ensemble. The, uh, the focus of this program was 
definitely for underserved kids, for kids at risk, for kids in poverty. And uh, Maestro Abreu was always clear about the basic idea of El Sistema, which was just simply this, the, it was this, that the experience of inclusion in ensemble work, in ensemble music, in collective striving toward musical beauty and musical excellence, that experience can be a powerful choice for positive change in the life of a child or a family or of a community. Uh, Venezuela's example was so powerful and so successful that in the 1980s and 1990s, programs uh, imitating it and modeling, modeled after it grew up all over Latin America, often helped by people from Venezuela. Um, but in this, uh, in, in our country, in, in the United States and in Europe and in Asia, uh, outside of Latin America, it wasn't very well known until the early 2000s when uh, its touring orchestras became so uh, excellent, achieved such a high level of excellence that they started to tour around the world, most prominently the Simon Bolivar Orchestra of Venezuela under the conductor Gustavo Dudamel, who grew up in El Sistema. And those orchestras appearing around the world brought the idea to the world in a powerful way. Um, that idea began to spread in the United States in particular in 2009, because Gustavo Dudamel came to Los Angeles to become the conductor there. Also because Maestro Abreu got a very prominent prize, the TED Prize, and was offered, was, and was offered the chance to help jumpstart an El Sistema program in the United States. So uh, most of the programs in, in, in Venezuela and in Latin America, the El Sistema programs were really geared toward and focused on helping children and families get sort of climb out of poverty uh, because they were in the most poverty stricken areas of Latin America. When I began to understand that this was really an international across the world global uh, development, um, my colleague and partner Eric Booth and I began to travel around the world in to do research for a book and also just to sort of satisfy our curiosity about what this what this phenomenon looked like in all the countries of the world. And as we traveled, we began to understand that the as El Sistema traveled around the world, its particular goals would be specific to whatever situation it was in, no matter where it was around the world. So it, it could look very different in terms of what the problems were that it was trying to address. So I would like to give you a few examples of what some of those various problems were and as you listen to me, definitely keep in mind our sustainable development goals and particularly the, the six that Katie highlighted that we turn out to be most interested in today. We went to Japan in 2012 and in 2013, and we discovered that their El Sistema was not the primary problem that El Sistema was being brought there to address was not poverty. It was as a result of the tsunami of 2011, where uh, <clears throat> many hundreds of children along the coast of uh, Fukushima were, uh, it was disaster for those children. They lost their families, they lost their homes. They were not poor. They were still being taken care of by their communities and housed and clothed and fed, but they were suffering from intense grief and sadness and loss. So it was that, that was the idea that the, uh, the people in the city of Soma, where was, where it was just the first El Sistema program in Japan, it was the coastal city in Fukushima, and the people there decided, the government there decided that what their children needed to address this collective enormous sadness was El Sistema. And what we saw was that uh, when we observed these programs was that indeed, El Sistema was providing these children with new families, essentially, with family, a sense of family and community in their musical ensembles to sort of replace the families and communities that they had so drastically lost. <clears throat> in Korea, the idea of El Sistema was adapted, again, not so much to address the question of poverty, but the government of South Korea in 2012, 2013 became very interested in El Sistema as a way to address the social isolation that they saw happening with their kids. 
Um, many children were single, were, the, were only children of families. They were very, very much uh, involved in their schoolwork and in their, um, their, technolo their technologies, their video games, their digital activities. And they were afraid that the children were losing the sense of being able to socialize and being able to be part of a cooperative, part of a collaborative, being part of a real social community. So that is the function that El Sistema fulfilled and still is fulfilling in Korea. Let's think about uh, countries in Europe, such as Romania, Bosnia, many other countries where, well, in Romania and Bosnia in particular, there were ethnic conflicts that were completely disruptive uh, in, a, in a number of places and in a number of ways. In Romania, what we saw was uh, children in Roma communities, Roma uh, being distinct from the children of the who were ethnic Romanian. Uh, and those children were isolated from the mainstream of culture in that country. And so El Sistema was brought there to help bring those ethnic communities together, give the children a way to be together that was free of all, all of the, the, so the sort of cultural tension and conflict that they had and be to, uh, to be able to actually make beautiful music together. So that is the ongoing project of the Sistema programs in Romania. In Bosnia, something very similar began in the ethnic enclaves of, um, of Sarajevo, uh, it's not of Sarajevo, I'm sorry, of uh, Srebrenica, in, um, which was the site of the of a massacre in 1995, the hostilities between the ethnic Serbs and the ethnic uh, the ethnic Bosnians, the Bosnian Muslims were still uh, sort of simmering under the surface uh, in the year many years after that, and so it was decided that an El Sistema program should be start, started there to help address the continuing sort of intransigent uh, divide between these these communities that had experienced such trauma. Uh, the, the interesting thing that we observed there was when they began an El Sistema program, they made sure that the children never sang together in either of their languages. They always sang in other languages. So that they never, the idea was to bring them together in languages where they didn't, that they didn't associate with any strife or conflict. Uh, gradually, those the, that program added instruments, and the children there are now playing and singing together in an extremely powerful way that has begun to bring those communities together. In Greece, there are a large number of refugees have been in the last four or five years, and El Sistema Greece has concentrated its efforts in those areas to help refugee children, both to help refugee children find a sense of community and activity and purpose in their refugee camps, but also to integrate them, help integrate them with the children of the larger Greek communities where those camps are. Uh, El Sistema Greece has done amazing and beautiful work in that area. And we've seen how uh, not only are those children served, but the entire community of refugees are served in many of those camps and, and the project of bringing them into the mainstream of the life of Greek children is um, ongoing and beautiful. Um, in, uh, in Sweden and in Denmark, there are also, it is also a question of primarily ethnic integration. That is the problem that El Sistema is there to solve by bringing children together, especially immigrant children, but also um, children from different ethnicities who are, who are not easily uh, assimilated into the mainstream of bringing them together and having a very, very multi-ethnic flavor to their El Sistema programs and always making sure that those programs are inclusive musically, inclusive culturally and ethnically so that all those cultures feel welcome. Uh, in Colombia, let's go back to Latin America, where I said that the, um, the, I, the first and foremost goal of El Sistema programs is to help children and communities out of poverty. In Colombia in the early 90s, during the uh, height of the civil war there, they, Colombia saw um, the problem of civil war and peace and reconciliation, eventual reconciliation being something that an El Sistema could definitely um, 
address as few other things could. So they started a program in 1990 called Batuta, which has since become vast, spread across Colombia. About 50,000 children are take part in that. And their uh, evolving purpose in those places is about not only about poverty amelioration, but also about gang warfare and gang, gang conflict and um, gang prevention. And the governments, what interested us there is that the governments at the federal level, at the provincial level, and at the municipal level found it so, um, actually found Batuta so useful in its work during the Civil War that they decided that was the most useful tool that they could fund to help with the ongoing problems of gang conflict and gang prevention. And so they that is submit that that program is supported to an extraordinary extent by governments in that country. And that is the ongoing idea. It's it's gangs, it's peace, it's reconciliation. And you see it's definitely goal 16 of the sustainable development goals. Um, I'm going to take one give you one more example before I wrap up this um, world tour. And that example is back in Venezuela, where uh, the administrators and leaders of the El Sistema there have always been at the forefront of understanding new things that the Sistema is capable of and understanding new frontiers that they can address. In the 90s, they began to think about differently abled kids. And they started the first program that really addressed differently abled kids in 1995 in the city of Barquisimeto, where Gustavo Dudamel was from. And they, their, their program was both to give children who, are, who were hearing disabled, who were sight disabled, who had all sorts of other um, ability challenges to come together and play music together or sing music together or create music together in whatever way they could. And not only in separate groups, but also to bring them all together in ensembles. They developed a whole library of, of uh, braille scores so that children who were uh, sight challenged could take could use that could take the braille scores home actually of the orchestral works that they were playing. They could learn they could learn and memorize them, and they could come back and play them in ensemble with children who were uh, not sight challenged. So. It was an incredible sort of expansion of the idea of inclusion to really mean every single child. And Venezuela has led us in that direction. They, in, they developed a, a, a model called the White Hands Chorus in which a part of the children are uh, hearing disabled, uh, hearing, hearing challenged, part of the children have other challenges. The hearing challenged children have white gloves in which they sort of act out choreographically the idea of the, whatever song is being sung by the children in the other half of the group. So they all are presented together, have part of the children singing vocally, part of the children singing with their hands. It is an incredibly powerful thing. So that is another uh, goal that El Sistema has been used very powerfully to address the goal of integrating and assimilating differently able children. And that idea has also gone around the world. There are white hands choruses now in many countries. So I'm going to uh, stop there and ask you to just think about um, some, of the th a lot, some of the things I've talked about in relation to these goals. Uh, and to think about the work that you do, you know very well that social transformation begins with individuals. It happens one individual at a time, and gradually that becomes family transformation, and gra gradually that becomes community transformation. You know this in your work. You're experts in these kinds of transformations. And it's this kind of transformation that the SDG goals are also after. Um, before I go to just a couple more words before I go to looking, asking you for your ideas about these goals in relation to what I've just talked about and in relation to the music that you do. Um, I want to mention that there is now, I told you that this was a fairly new idea of artists, change makers in the world of the arts, trying to, starting to think about what 
change makers in the field of development are thinking about and particularly addressing the SDGs. Uh, there is, I want to tell you about one university program in Austria the, at the University of Graz where there is actually an international master's program in sustainable development and they have formed what they call an interdisciplinary practicum called IP Systema and together they are organizing their studies around the topic of sustainability impacts of El Sistema motivated initiatives. So that's something you might want to know about and look up. I'll make sure to get the info about that to Pedro so that you can all have that. Um, they have a blog, they have a Facebook page called Music for Sustainability. And one of the members of this cohort, uh, Enrico Alejandro Perdomo, who is from Venezuela, actually completed a master's thesis, I think it's the first one in the world, on the subject of El Sistema and, and the Sustainable Development Goals. He spent a lot of time in the paper doing what an in, in a very in-depth way what we're talking about now. He chose seven of the SDGs that he thinks El Sistema programs can contribute to, and I think they include, they pretty much map against the ones that, that we've chosen today. Um, the paper is full of interesting insights. We'll also see if we can make that available to you if you'd like to read it. His conclusion was, this investigation leads to the understanding that oriented musical education programs, which not only impart music, but also integrate matters of SDGs and uh, emotional social development, can have a powerful impact on sustainable development. So with all of that in mind, um, Katie, I'd like you to guide us in a, in a group discussion of these these goals in relation to what I've talked about and in relation to the work that we all do. Thank you, Trisha. Really interesting points from around the world. Um, we had a point brought up. I asked the group if there were other countries or if they from their own countries they had experience in some of the music programs trying to accomplish these sustainable development goals. Uh, Claudio from Brazil brought up Neojiba, which is a systemic inspired program that I'm familiar with, but he shared that he feels like it's a pretty, it's an isolated approach. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of the other countries in Latin America that you've written more extensively about, perhaps in Bolivia and some of the other countries surrounding Venezuela. Sure. Uh, I. I, the ones that I know best, and I can't say my, my knowledge is comprehensive at all, uh, the ones that I know best because I've been there are Neojiva in Brazil. Uh, there is also um, a beautiful program in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and I've also visited a really powerful one in Brazil in the interior in the city of Campos. Um, and so there are uh, those three separate and probably, and there are more in Brazil than that, but all, all sort of orga organized around the same goals and the same ideals and sort of doing the same thing in all those very different places. Uh, those are not connected by any national network. In Colombia, on the other hand, Batuta, as I mentioned, is, is a national network. There are also other music, music education for social change programs, many of them in, in Colombia, that are not members of Batuta, uh, one of the main ones is called La Red in Medellin, uh, but there are many. Um, I've seen some in Cali. I've seen them in Medellin. There are, there's a map, there's a, like a huge network of ones in Colombia. And one of the things that Batuta does is try to get them integrated and keep them integrated. It's one of the services it, it provides. Uh, in Mexico, there is a national system of program called Fomento. Uh, I can't remember the whole name, but it's, uh, it's funded by at the federal level and at lower levels, and it has um, nucleos programs in many, many of the, the states, I think all maybe all of the states of Mexico. There is also another one in Mexico called um, Esperanza Azteca, which is separate from the government one, although they work sometimes they work in conjunction, they work very much along the same lines and for the same goals, but that one is financed by uh, corporate, a combination of corporate and government money. Let's bring Marcelo back into the conversation, if you wouldn't mind turning on your webcam. Uh, this 
brings to mind a question I have and has come up in some instances in the chat box from others, the different approaches between a national government system uh, supporting efforts like a widespread music education program that is connected and the same everywhere or united by a set of shared criteria versus small independent programs or a more privatized approach. Um, as Marcelo, you were mentioning, this new iteration of sustainable development goals is the first time private enterprise has really been invited to or considered a, an important voice in uh, reaching these goals. Could you both maybe talk about the somewhat different approaches? I can say at El Sistema USA, although we're a national system, we're a connection of independent organizations. So each one of our members is its own, um, has its own approach towards using music for social change in that community. And what that has done is created great variety and diversity in approach, but where it has made things more difficult is to be able to measure progress towards a, a sustainable development goal when we're all using a variety of tools in order to get there. Would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? Why don't you go and then I'll follow. Okay, thank you. So in my opinion, I think um, there are different individual circumstances. Um, different countries will have their own social, economic um, circumstances, cultural um, differences and so on. <clears throat> that will probably determine how this type of initiatives may work better. When it comes, however, to accessing funding, I think um, all these different approaches are valid. Um, if, for example, I think it will depend on what is the source of funding. For example, if the source of funding is to be uh, from multilateral uh, financing, uh, meaning, for example, from multilateral in, or uh, financial institutions, then um, I'm sure that um, the government will have to play a role uh, if you are talking about a developing country. So the, the government, you have, you'll have to go through the Ministry of Education or some kind of ministry to try to get uh, funding from entities like, for example, the World Bank or some other regional development banks, because they usually work through governments. Um, so that on one hand. On the other hand, you now have private funding that is, it's a relatively new area, it's a new field. Traditionally, what happened within the private sector is that for music education purposes, the funding was coming from philanthropy, right, from the private sector. Now we see that there is the rise of the responsible investor and some of the responsible investors, some of those that are getting into the responsible investment train, they are becoming interested in impact investing, either because it's in line with their um, investment objectives or either because that's part of their mandate in any case. So impact investors are another source of uh, uh, funding opportunities nowadays. What is crucial though is for a music education project to be able to present a compelling case that um, has a well thought um, theory of change. So meaning that, for example, we're talking about achieving this or contributing to these sustainable development goals. So it's important to show what is the impact, right? Not only at the individual level, for example, uh, the, 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 the music student, but also in terms of how you can connect those individual stories into a more um, social or societal change um, theory. Uh, to the extent that you can develop that theory of change um, and present that as a sort of an impact reporting framework, then I think you're opening up um, very interesting opportunities with the um, uh, impact investing sector that is now growing and it's growing um, very fast, I would say. Um, I think the um, theory of change, how to develop and how to craft a, a, a good theory of change as well as an impact reporting framework is a whole topic in itself. Uh, we can probably devote another another uh, presentation only to discuss that, but for those interested, I would be happy to um, point them to some resources, both within the World Bank as well as other organizations. 
Yeah, I, I would also point out those resources are available through the Global Leaders Program as part of some of the webinars that are available to you now. So be sure to check out some of the other uh, sessions that have been part of this COVID-19 response. Great. Um, Marcelo mentioned the, uh, the corporate, uh, the corp a sort of corporate investor response. And that is new uh, in, El in the El Sistema world. We haven't been thinking that way really very much, but we really do need to. In its development, in terms of its long-term development, uh, El Sistema programs uh, in, in Latin America were often funded by the government. Uh, really not very much anywhere else. In uh, the States and in most of Europe and Asia, no, not all of Asia. In Korea, it's funded by the federal government. But in mo many other places, I would say most other places, it began to be funded just philanthropically. One exception was the Philippines, where it was funded by a huge uh, corporate uh, actor who decided that it was part of his their, their social, their corporate social responsibility to, to uh, create that program. Uh, in Europe, the exception is Scotland and England, where there is a there is a government, uh, a national government association that uh, that funds and supports partly partly funds and supports the El Sistema programs in those countries, which I think has led to a more robust, um, uh, more effective sort of network. And they are also able to measure. We're speaking about measurement and accountability. I know. Um, Marshall Marcus is in the house and he's talking about joint agreed measurement, which is a, in the comment chat in the chat box, that joint agreed measurement is a hugely important area. In Scotland and in uh, England, they, I, I feel they have been able to measure the effects of their programs more, more effectively than we have often in who, uh, those of us who are only funded, the programs funded just in the private sector. So I think that it's really important for us to begin to think about moving uh, away from dependence on the philanthropic private sector and into thinking more about both government and corporate uh, investment. Really important to go in those directions. Uh, I think if I may add to, to, to these um, brief statements, I think it's also important to keep in mind that to, to access, for example, or to unlock um, resources from impact investors it's important to try to also look at how to make a business case <clears throat> right i mean um both the profit as well as the impact will have to go together uh, and i think that's one of the challenges right uh, that's that's one of the challenges when, when when it comes to music education um it it's some kind uh, i would say that the, in the majority of cases it's easy to see the connection between the social impact and a public good. Um, impact investors, though, um, many of them would be willing, for example, to invest in a project only for the purpose of impact, of social impact. But to try to go to a much bigger scale, um, it will be important also to see how this could be an opportunity to create um, some kind of financial return that goes together with um, social impact. Now, that's far easier said than done. Um, and in, in many aspects, it might also be also controversial, but uh, I think the challenge is precisely how can we figure out how to unlock those resources from, from impact investors that are willing to, to invest money, but um, they will also be expecting some, some level of financial return. Yeah, I don't want to speak too deeply to this because it's been a long time since I looked at the study, but the Inter-American Development Bank did a study on the return on investment of their dollars where it was a, um, I can't remember the numbers, but it was a significant turnaround for every dollar invested in El Sistema in Venezuela. They were getting significantly more back uh, than their investment. It was a dollar sixty-eight. was the... Thank you. More recently, there was an impact study like that done in Glasgow, Scotland, that in 2016, I think, reported out that um, the they studied they they did a model that studied the economic long-term economic benefit for Glasgow itself for uh, investing in systemic programs, and they found and, and I'm just really shortening this um, and simplifying it 
for these purposes, it's more complex, but they found that in the near term, in the first few years, the city itself, um, oh, <laughs> the city <laughs> itself was going to uh, lose some money in, an, if it's, in investing in Sistema programs, it was going to lose some money, but in three years, it would break even, and in 10 years or 15 years, it would vastly save the city money. Um, mm. the, the, the exact figures are in my book, um, and you can get them, you, you know, we can, we can get them to you, but that, the impact studies that have been done, the few that have been done, point in that direction. We need a lot more of those. And I think that's where, where the concept of partnerships becomes crucial because in many, especially developing countries, um, I think it's um, very difficult to think of uh, only private initiatives or only public. In many cases, there will be a need for a combination of both public and private resources. And for that, probably um, that's when this concept of impact investing could become relevant, uh, but it will also probably have to be tied to some level of public um, support as well to, to, make, to make the business case on the other hand. Right. I am posting in the chat box the links to the studies that we just mentioned. And Tricia, if you wouldn't mind posting the Scotland study. Yes, I can. I think I can. That you mentioned, I found the Inter-American Development Bank study. Okay, I will look for that. Um, I'm wondering if there, if um, in the in the chat box and in the just the, our general listenership, if if ideas are forming about how what they do can impact really concretely these six goals that they were that they were looking at um i agree with you guys that those six good health and well-being quality education gender inequality re reduced inequalities sustainable cities and communities and peace justice and strong institutions i can definitely see how music for social change programs would impact those but it's that's a different statement from saying this is exactly how it's going to happen. Here's a concrete example of how it has happened, and here is how, exactly how it will happen. And I think it's th this is a thought experiment that is really important that we all start doing, um, is sort of saying, how can I actually document what I know to be true about my work? How can I actually um, give concrete instances where the work that I've done has actually contributed to, say, gender inequality or sustainable communities. Does I have, anybody... a, there, there was an example shared actually mm -hmm. from uh, California, it's called Enriching Lives Through Music. And it's the example that they shared is one that is happening, I know, across the world, um, which is El Sistema inspired programs or communities of creative youth development programs are using the social capital that they've built with their families to raise money, food, emergency resources, non-musical resources and resources that are linked directly to the sustainable development goals and increasing the financial capacity or increasing the social capital of the families where they, who they support um, using the community that they've built through music to then uh, support these families in direct ways uh, as identified by the sustainable development goals. So uh, Lives Through Music shared that they raised $40,000 in cash to distribute to their families um, in response to the pandemic. And I think it's a real time of innovation in thinking about ways that music programs are thinking about the true, the, as you said, the, the true difference that they can make in, in, in an immediate way in the right. lives of the families that they support. Right. And I think, for um, example, um, projects in music education can also contribute to other SDGs. For example, if we think about climate action, if you embed um, some adaptation strategies within the, the music education program, it may actually enhance the capacity of children or communities to understand what they need to learn, 
to adapt to to you know different climate scenarios. So exactly. I, I would I would encourage everybody to to be very creative and start thinking of different ways on how you know these activities can actually um, be mainstreamed across all the SDGs. Exactly. Yeah, I know that visual arts, there are visual arts programs for social change that have actually, that have done a lot in the area of um, climate climate action, um, sustainable cities by making projects out of uh, sort of going out and collecting found objects and trash and garbage and then making, and then making art out of them. So uh, sort of symbolizing um, an ethos of responsible consumption and not just leaving trash around. And and so I'm sure, you know, the, I think the, the the opportunities are endless for music education programs for social change to be creative, as you say. Imagine imagine ways that that while you're doing the work that you're doing so well that's both musical and social development, you're also educating children about these actual things, raising their consciousness and changing their habits even about climate action and sustainable cities and responsible consumption. We have the luxury of a lot of time with children. And so we really can, um, all of those things can be part of, part of the world that we create for them. There have been uh, a number of calls for copies of this master's thesis. So if I, I, mean, if I, I do that. I'm, not, I'm not sure I can put my hands on that or the Scotland study in, in the next 14 minutes, but I will get them to Pedro and make them, hopefully Great. he can make them available to everyone. Yes, we can make it available. Yeah. Um, Thank you. We're going to launch the student's career. <laughs> <laughs> I know, he'll be surprised. <laughs> but I think he's the only one who's done this. Yeah. That's great. Um, another aspect of that Glasgow study that was really, really important is that it, uh, one of the findings was that it enhanced public health. So there you have uh, sustainable goal number three, sustainable development goal number three, actually right there that found, they found evidence that public, that according to the, the way that they, the ways that they measure public health, this program was substantially committed to public health in their communities. Um, so that's another way that you can think of your work. Uh, I have found the Scotland study. I'm going to post them here. Great. Great. And it's a, they have a series of studies, actually. This is a program that has really worldwide had impact evaluation as part of its ethos from early on. So it's great to see how they've grown over time. I can also speak to the idea of gender equality, which probably um, you guys have a lot of experience with in the work that you're doing now. And in the Sistema programs that I've seen, that has been huge in a lot of places. Their um, young girls and young women feel are, are so completely included and valued that they they learn a new uh, they learn a new identity of, about themselves uh, as being they really become empowered in ways that they weren't before through music but then it becomes about about everything um, so i think that that direct um, connection is really strong too lindsay callahan i don't mean to put you on the spot but i'm kind of putting you on the spot would you mind sharing a bit more about the climate initiative through the music program and the dublin youth choir You can turn on your webcam. Aha, she cannot turn on her camera. Yeah. No worries. Thanks so much for mentioning it. We'll be sure to check it out. And if there's a link to that that we can provide, that would be great. Yes, please do, the, to the Dublin Youth Choir's Climate Initiative. Trisha, did you have you covered what you wanted to cover with some of the work that was being done in the interdisciplinary practicum in Austria? I I think let me see if there's if there's more to that than I mentioned. The, I I think what I told you is that is kind of all I know that that is an ongoing international master's program that they have that practicum they have a blog and a Facebook page. And there is this one master study that comes out of it. Um, I think I think that 
this idea that the academic world is eventually is becoming more interested in El Sistema certainly and in arts for social change in general and that we'll, we're going to be seeing more of that kind of study. I know that El Sistema has 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 stem has um, spurred a lot of academic work, master's theses, even um, doctoral theses, uh, not necessarily uh, bringing in the sustainable development goals side of things, but about the work of El Sistema. Yeah. What I find interesting and, and would love to see as a next step is the research that has been done in El Sistema in the United States, and I, I think also worldwide, is this idea of uh, the improvements that are possible in executive function in mm -hmm. the way that we make decisions and um, respond to uh, choices in our lives as we grow from childhood into adulthood and how that improve that improved decision making ability and ability to uh, resist impulse control, the ability to be a critical thinker, to apply new knowledge in, or to apply existing knowledge to new situations, how we might link that improvement in executive function to accomplishing some of the sustainable development goals and the choices. I would that say we make. all of them, really yeah. all of them. Um, you know, I know one of the first things I noticed the first time I looked at the sustainable development goals was that none of them addressed culture and arts. Mm. And at first I thought that's a that's problematic. You know, where are culture and the arts here? And since then, as I've been thinking about it and delving into it more, I've been realizing that that's fine because what we are, the arts, culture in general, the, the arts, arts education, what we are is the driver of all of these things. We are an accelerator of development of all of these goals. So it's, we're not a box. We're, we're a, a, a force, an energy that really can propel a lot of these goals. Uh, I, I, again, I mean, I keep coming back to this idea of impact measurement because I think and, and this is something that is just very underdeveloped in, in El Sistema, certainly, and in a lot of arts for social change arenas. And I don't know about the work that all of you do, but you might that might have a resonance with you that it um, that your work, while powerful and impactful, is not accurately, is not enough documented, um, adequately documented. And we also know that it's hard to document and measure and assess some of the goals that we're after, like um, improved social skills, improved social emotional development, as well as improved musical skills. Those are hard to measure and hard to document, but I, it really is incumbent upon us, uh, us all as a, as a field, I think, to develop, to work on that, to develop those uh, measurements, to develop um, impact studies that can more or less accurately really, really describe in numbers and statistics and um, cold hard data, what we all know to be true in our hearts and our emotions and our daily lives. Because that is the way that we're going to really be able to form partnerships with uh, government agencies, with NGOs, with uh, corporate investors that Marcella was talking about. We are gonna be able to, we're really gonna be empowered to form those partnerships and move forward with those sorts of actors if we can, if we can show, if we can document more adequately what we, the impact of what we do. So that's just um, to sort of, you throw you that challenge to go back into your work lives and be thinking about that at all times as you as you um, work on this new challenge obviously of how you're delivering your services without ever seeing children yeah. or young people in the flesh that's huge um but it the work does go on i know that a lot of your work goes on and as you as you do that work be thinking about be thinking about your work in the framework that that we're talking about today, how incredibly impactful you your work can be in contributing to all of these goals and and think about how you can make your case. What we need to Indeed. do, what we what we need to be able to really make our case that we are 
powerful allies in this. Thank you so much. I just want to point out one of the uh, a really beautiful point was brought to the forefront by Lindsay Callahan in uh, exactly what you were describing in what they're doing in Dublin through the Dublin Youth Choir. They're creating a policy, a green policy uh -huh. to include how the singers get to choir rehearsals, what they bring to choir, all of the, the different aspects and they're measuring uh, the work that they're doing in order to really see how this policy is affecting accomplishing the climate goals that they're trying to, to achieve. Fantastic. Just an excellent example. And I think that um, I'm sure that everybody in, in the audience will have um, very um, great examples to share. Uh, but I'm very happy to see that, um, you know, people are exploring and they are looking at um, different aspects, not only, uh, Trisha, as you said, within one box, but rather across the spectrum of all the possible uh, sustainable development goals. And I think that's the key to try to think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, think outside the, the 17 boxes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much to our speakers, Trisha and Marcelo. Thank you for bringing uh, new knowledge to us and also for helping us dive a little bit deeper into some of the concepts that we may have already discovered. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much to the Global Leaders Program for hosting this webinar. It's been our pleasure. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so for... much, Katie. Katie, thank you so much. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you for sharing your very, very valuable insights. Um, uh, we are looking forward to hearing more from you, always. And uh, just to uh, close our today's meeting, I would like to invite you to our upcoming events. Please join in for a peer support task force discussion on diversity and inclusion next Wednesday at 3.30. And on Friday, May 1st, uh, COVID-19, can we find a gift in this adversity? This will be presented by Dr. Norman E. Rosenthal from Georgetown University School of Medicine. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you all soon at our future events. Have a good evening, have a good afternoon, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye, everyone.